Good morning. Good to see everybody here today. I, uh, I just want to uh, just make a quick note for those who follow us on uh, video. Uh, of course, it started on the church's Facebook page, but we've lost administrative rights to that and still are having issues trying to get that resolved. So picked it up with my own uh, Facebook page. Uh, but the titles of each of these have been, you know, through the series, one of 13 and two and so on and so forth. Well, one of the lessons actually was there was so much content. Uh, so basically, uh, the title on this one says, I think, 12 of 14. So anyhow, uh, just administrative stuff. Uh, and, and a commercial. We also get a commercial. Um, it's good to see everybody here today. Uh, but Joel, uh, Madumba Joel there with Fountain of Love Orphanage in Uganda, uh, he says hello to everybody and thanks us all for groceries and stuff that we help with. Uh, but he says, um, please ask the brethren uh, for some funds so that we can uh, start uh, uh, our garden. So I told him I would, I would specifically mention that. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. There are uh, a number of paragraphs in this chapter. There's actually seven paragraphs in here which <clears throat> describe the resurrection, the reality of the re resurrection. And I, I, what Paul is doing here is is that there seems to be a concern, uh, some, some misunderstanding, even some flat denial going on of the resurrection of Christ. And so they put forth some questions in here, you know, and maybe the questions themselves aren't even specifically mentioned, but because of what information Paul gives us, we can... Uh, deduce what questions were being asked, what issues the brethren here had. And one of the problems as a result of not understanding or not believing in the resurrection, I mean, why are we Christians? Really, why are we here? It's because we were told that God, uh, the Son of God, died for our sins, and that he arose from the grave. And he says, based upon what he did for us, that if we ourselves die, are buried, we too can be resurrected. In other words, I don't have to be stuck in the dirt for eternity. I get to go to heaven. Right? And uh, that's a great story. That is something worth sharing. If people don't believe that, it's not something that they share. And Christianity is solely based upon a resurrected Savior. If people don't believe it, they're not going to tell it. They're not going to share it. There is a... There is a uh, an, an apathy that develops. And so Paul has got to teach on that very thing. So the first thing that he does is that he defines the gospel, and this is in the first few verses of chapter 15. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Because somebody... There are some bodies in this congregation that are not holding fast to that. You know, you're, they're given the information and thinking, man, I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, uh, if this is real or not. And so it's, 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 it, this belief that they started out uh, with is beginning to wane. But he says, for I delivered to you as a first importance, see that priority there? What I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And he appeared 
to Cephas, to, tw- uh, to the twelve. After that, it appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain now un- uh, uh, until now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as if it were to one untimely bo- uh, born, he appeared to me also. And he says, I am the least of the apostles there. Uh, uh, and he, he says why he was the least. But, you know, the, the thing is that there are, there are three aims of the gospel that is preached. And this is seen in the first couple of verses here. There is first that reception of it. Galatians chapter, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Therefore I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul is saying that. You know why Paul says that to the Galatians in chapter 1, verse 12? Uh, he says that because nobody, nobody on earth was going to teach Paul about a resurrected Savior. The Jews weren't going to do it. Why? Because the Jews didn't like Christianity. They didn't want Christianity. They thought Christianity slapped the Old Testament teachings right in the face. They weren't going to have anything to do with it. The Jews were not going to teach them. Uh, a resurrected Christ to Paul. You know why the Christians weren't going to teach Paul? Because any Christian who would have approached then Saul, before his name was changed to Paul, any Christian that approached him said, Hi, Saul, let me tell you about Jesus. What was he going to do? He was going to grab them by the scruff of the neck and throw them in prison, if not kill them. Because Saul was a Pharisee among Pharisees, as the Bible describes him. The only person that was going to convert Paul was a resurrected Savior. And that's exactly what happened on a road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. We're told that story there. And so there is a standing then that takes place. 1 Corinthians chapter Uh, 16, verse 13, it says, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. We are able to stand firm, like we are told in this uh, place in Scripture, because of what we 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 have been taught. Jesus is not stuck in the grave. There is evidence for that. We just discussed one, a converted Paul. You know, we could talk about the change the lives of the disciples. What did Thomas do? Unless I stick my finger in the holes of his hand and thrust my hand in the side where, where we knew that spear went while he was still on that cross, I am not going to believe. But when Jesus stood before him, what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. You can't deny the evidence for the resurrection. And then, of course, we have the salvation that results from that. He says in verse 2, by which you are also saved. Without the gospel, there is no hope of heaven. Without coupling your life to the gospel, you have no hope of heaven. Without believing this, and, and I would say that first, I think it's First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 8, but it's easy enough. If I'm wrong, you can go to Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. But what it tells us there is that the gospel has to be obeyed. So for people who say all you have to do to believe, all you have to do to be saved is believe, I will tell them that's a flat, devilish lie. Because Scripture does not teach that. Can you go to places where it says if you confess with your mouth and believe, you'll be saved? Sure can. Don't take it out of contest. Don't look at one passage to the denial of another. If it says you have to obey the gospel, you have to obey the gospel. And don't tell me that obeying the gospel by being baptized is a work of man because God commands it. What When people say, When people say that, what they are in fact implying is that God is wrong. 
When God says, be baptized, it's not a work of man. It is a command of God. That's what it is. And so Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, it tells us how it, it's, it is a picture. This, this is a picture. I want you to see this, okay? Not just hear the words, but I want you to see this as well. He says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? You can't get around the death of Christ. There. He died on the cross. What did they do? They took him down off of it. They, they prepared his body for a burial. They, 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 they put the shroud on that. They sewed that shroud shut. They, that's what they usually did. You know, uh, they, they had spices that they put in there to, uh, uh, as a part of the decomposition process. And we know that they, we know the people who buried bodies understood the decomposition process. Because what did, what, did, what did they all say when Jesus is standing before Lazarus' tomb? They said, by now, the King James Version says, by now he stinketh. He's been in there four days. They knew that bodies decompose, right? And so they prepared Jesus' body. He died. This passage goes on to say, therefore we have been buried with him through death, uh, through baptism into death. That as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We know that some of the disciples went to that tomb early on a Sunday morning, early on the first day of the week. And the first thing they think about is, why is the tomb rolled away? Why, why, I mean, why is, why is the, uh, uh, the stone rolled away from the tomb? It shouldn't be. There was a Roman guard placed there. A Roman seal was placed upon it. They actually had, when they rolled that stone in, in, and closed off that tomb, there was a piece of clay that was jammed in, in, in that crack of the door there, between, between the door and the, and the door jam itself. And then a Roman seal was placed on that. If anybody came up there and they saw that there, they would know that they would, by pain of death, break that seal. It was gone. Why is this, why is this stone rolled away? This begs, this begs for somebody to look in there. And what'd they do? It's exactly what they did. They looked in there. There's nobody there. Jesus rose from the grave. Folks, that's how we obey the gospel. Paul clearly says that in Romans chapter 6, verses 3, 4, and 5. If you don't obey the gospel, yes, you have to believe it. Yes, you have to believe that. But we also have to follow through. And that requires action on our part. We call that what Paul called it, obeying. In beginning in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, <clears throat> we find that the gospel was denied. This, what we're talking about, they, they, just, they didn't believe it. Uh, he says, now if, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? We, we, the, the prior, the prioritized message, the, 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 the foundation, the very first thing we told you, basically. Isn't that what he said? I delivered to you as of first importance, verse 3. That's what got them their start in the kingdom of Christ. That's what placed them in the church. That's what added them to the body. Acts chapter 2, toward the end of the chapter there. They were added that day, about 3,000 souls. After doing what? After obeying what Peter told them in verse 38. Okay. 
And, and then after doing all of that, they're starting to say, wait a second. I, there's no resurrection. There's no resurrection. You know, we, we put Henry, we buried Henry. You know, he's, he's, he's there. You know, he's got the tombstone over there. There's dates, born here, died here. You know, his life, that little parentheses in between there. That's, that's what it, that's, that's it. He's still there. There's no claw marks for him coming out, you know, and, and so they're spreading this, uh, uh, bad information with folks. Sadducees were skeptics. Matthew 22, verse 33, what does it say of the Sadducees there? Who believe not in the resurrection. On that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and questioned him. You know, of course, the thing they're... Asking about is marriage and stuff. Jesus teaches them, but the point is that there are some people that don't believe in it. You know, and and skeptics. There are all kinds of skeptics. We run into. I mean, how many people live in Blair? There's what the census about eight thousand. What's that? Yeah, seventy seven hundred. Now I'm, I have no doubt that we're not the only group of people in this community who believe in Jesus because there are, there's what close to a dozen. Well, I'm thinking of one group, but there's probably got to be two dozen other quote unquote Christian groups and they believe in Jesus. Right? But beyond that, beyond that, there are a whole lot of people in this city, you know, that don't believe in a resurrection. And probably lar- largely in part that they too have maybe driven by the cemetery and the only holes they see in the ground is for somebody that's fixing to go in there. Um, there are seven problems, though, that are created by denying the gospel, and these are seen in verses 13 through 19. Let's go through this list kind of quickly. Number one, from verse 13, Christ is still in the grave. From number 14, from verse 14, the second problem is that preaching or teaching a gospel is useless. If there's no resurrection, Let's stop teaching that Jesus did that. Bigger than that, though. Bigger than that, though. Because of what we read about why Christ came to earth in the first place, beginning with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we should not even be preaching the existence of Jesus in the, at all. Because it's pointless to teach about somebody uh, who had one goal in life, and that was to be a redeemer. And if there's no resurrection, so much for his goal, right? The third problem is that the sin and guilt of lying is applicable to all who teach the gospel. If anybody in this room has ever shared to anybody else about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you would be guilty of one of the seven sins that God hates, according to the book of Proverbs. Right? The fourth problem is that no one then is able to be raised from the dead from verse 16. 
probably the worst problem of all is that, number five, is that faith in all religion then would be pointless. Think about this for just a minute. If there's no resurrection, uh, that makes God to be a liar. And if God is a liar, then God can't be God because that really puts him no different than we are. And if that's the case, then there is no God. Yeah, that's exactly right. A house divided against itself can't stand. And so, yeah, the, uh, yeah, that's, it would destroy faith. Number six, those in past history who placed their trust in a future event. How many old, uh, I have to jump over to Hebrews real fast. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Um, Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. <clears throat> and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom, who, to whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Abraham saw that God was capable of doing this. But if there's no resurrection, even Abraham will not receive that blessing, right? Then the last problem, Christians for believing in something false are sadly looked upon, verse 15. And I mean, really, if there's no resurrection, let's just, let's just go home, mow our lawns. You know, and do whatever we do on, on a weekend, right? Um, yeah. So there's, there's a problem with believing, uh, with, uh, believing not in a resurrection. Can't deny that. Um, verses 30 through 32, it says that there was a, uh, there was a danger, you know, uh, with Paul. Let's read that. He says, uh, why are we also in danger every hour? I protest, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, he says, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Um, yeah, again, I mean, what point? The very dangers that Paul faced I think, are also an evidence of the truth of the gospel. Why put yourself through persecution if such reasons for that persecution are, in fact, not real? Right? <clears throat> Verses 33 and... 34, he says, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Why toss that passage into the middle of all this? I'll tell you why. Paul is telling the Christians that are hanging around these uh, deniers, these people who are spreading rumors about the resurrection of Christ, he's telling them, stay away from these people. It's going to have an adverse effect upon the choices that you make. And that's true. What kinds of lives do people live who don't believe in a resurrection? Are their moral standards not corrupt? They exactly are. They believe in all kinds of heinous things. They have no problem at all. Stealing, lying, hating, hurting. 
It's, yeah. And so he says, be careful. Become sober-minded as you ought. Stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. And so the, the fifth paragraph we see beginning uh, uh, in, in verse 35, it's talking about what the gospel kind of looks like, okay? And, and so basically, the, the, you know, the, the skeptics, you know, are asking these questions or bringing these questions to light. Uh, he says in verse 35, someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what, bo- what kind of body do they come? Of course, Paul, you know, he, he says, wait a second, you fool, you, you foolish person, quit such thinking. That which you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. I planted a, I was told, you know, if, if you stick a seed in a banana, it will help that seed to germinate more quickly. And, and I like cherries and I get cherry trees will grow around here, I guess. And, uh, so I, uh, got a banana and I stuck that cherry seed in there and I buried it in dirt, you know, and, and so I've been kind of watering, waiting for a little, you know, tree to come up. And you'll see off the sides, you know, other things will come up. I'll pull those out of there. I don't want them taking my nutrients from the banana. <clears throat> a couple of days ago, I went out there and it's gone. There was a hole there. Squirrel, grab my seed. The banana's gone. Grab the banana. It's, uh, but that was a dead seed. And things don't grow unless they die first. So Paul is using these illustrations, you know, and he's letting people know that, you know, our resurrection, it's, it's, we have to understand, doesn't matter how much our body decays, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, uh, it, it's, and this is a reality of death, but he says to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it'll grow for you. You shall eat of the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. Yeah, this body is going to decay. Um, it, it's when we, when it dies, uh, cell growth will cease and it will begin to uh, deteriorate. It's going to turn into dust. That's what God says here. Some people do it faster through cremation, right? Uh, I, Don was laughing at something else. I thought he chuckled at what I just said. How, how does the body, how is the, you know, what Paul is trying to tell people here is that it's going to be different. It is going, it's not going to be the same. Jesus even told the Sadducees in heaven, there's no marriage. It's not going, there's, it's not going to be there. You know, I, I don't know what heaven will exactly be like. But we're going to look different. We're going to be given a body that feels no pain. Uh, There there won't be any suffering there. There won't be any, uh, when I say feels no, there won't be any pain. There won't be physical pain. There won't be emotional pain. That's done away with. What's that body going to look like? I don't care. I really don't, as long as I'm there, right? Uh, and so that, I think that's what he's trying to get across to them there. And, and so he, he illustrates this, you know. And so, <clears throat> uh, you know, using, using uh, uh, plants, he says, the resurrection of the, of the dead, it's sown in a perishable, perishable body, verse 42. It is raised an imperishable body. 
It's sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. We need to be clear on that. And then the the sixth par, uh, uh, paragraph, it describes then for us the gospel's death of death. All right? Let's, let's read beginning in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead uh, will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There are limitations of uh, uh, here. There are limitations of the flesh, and there's limitations of the perishable. They can only take us so far. They can only take us so far. But then, of course, we have those transformations. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, <clears throat> we have another description of what we just read about in uh, in these few verses. But he says here, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. I like the fact that Paul speaks of the saved whose physical body stopped working and then that family, those people, Put that body in a tomb. Paul describes those of our brethren as not dead, but merely asleep. That's a pretty good way to... I must have been tired last night because I didn't move. When I got to bed, uh, Daisy was right here and 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 she just kind of wanted to lay, you know, across the bed. And so Sherry is over there on the other side. And then the cat was down here at my feet. And so I'm kind of kitty wapus uh, in the bed. And, you know, couldn't turn this way and couldn't turn that way. And I woke up in the same position. I must have been asleep. I was, I was dead asleep. Right? Yeah. That was, that was a good night of rest. can't imagine what it's going to be like to wake up from this sleep. But he, but he continues here in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and, the, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And we're told at the end of that passage, therefore comfort one another with these words. Those words that we just read, are to help people get through whatever persecutions this life has, however small, however large, whether they're emotional, whether they're physical. We are told to keep our eyes upon that event because it will get us through, right? <coughs> Verse 58 
of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, is a passage that has some interesting implications here. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You know, he's basically saying it doesn't matter how you work, just work. doesn't matter how you practice your faithfulness, just practice your faithfulness, right? But what's implied here is that when people stop believing in the gospel that this chapter describes, they begin to be apathetic about their faith. They stop sharing about a resurrected Jesus. They stop telling people of a future heaven. They, they, they close a conversation about an eternal paradise. And Paul is saying, don't do that. He says, therefore, Therefore means, based upon everything that we have just discussed, he says, be steadfast, be immovable. Don't stray from the course you're on. Amen? Have you been saved like we have heavily discussed in this passage? If you haven't, you can. You just got to let folks know that you want this, that you want heaven, that you want eternal life, that when you croak, you won't be dead, you just be sleeping. You just got to ask for it. Sometimes like take a little bit of courage, little bit of courage. That's that's understandable. I because what's going to happen? You're going to go to the people that have known you for as long as they've known you up until now, and you're going to be telling about something new in your life, and some of them are going to think, that's cool. Others are going to think, you're a flipping nut. And that's a fact of the matter. And that's okay. Because some people, this is nuts. And that's all right. We just pray for those to get over that and and come to the reality of what is fact, what is truth, what is real, and hope they too respond to it. So if there's any specific need that you have, let us know while we stand and sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste to its breeze.